Hi, I'm back again. Uh, so wearing the I, I'm, I know the lighting will get better. Uh, just I have a limited budget and uh, it'll, it'll just get better. I want it to get better. Anyway, that's not the purpose of my video. That's the purpose of some other video. <laughs> um, this video is about what I've learned in terms of music, in terms of composing music. Now, I have another channel um, devoted to my creative aspects. This, is, this channel is primarily devoted to exploration. It's about exploring ideas and interesting ways of looking at things and theories about how the universe works and so forth, all that wonderful, and how the mind works in psychology and so forth, understanding yourself better. But uh, <laughs> I couldn't wait until this Saturday when I would probably be creating my artistic, uh, my channel, my video for my artistic channel. So I want to share it with you. Okay, it's a few things I've picked up about composing music. A little quick history. Um, I hadn't ever written music before. Um, it had been basically poetry. I started off um, as a little, maybe a toddler, at least element, early elementary school, maybe um, seven or eight, something like that. I remember writing stories. I still have them. I should still have these stories I would write and sometimes poetry, but really primarily just for school, if there was a school assignment. And I had a knack for it, um, I think. Um, I wasn't writing a lot of poetry, you know, basically my free time. I was primarily writing stories in my free time. And I was all, all involved in television, and, and there goes a motorcycle in the background. Um, I was uh, writing um, stories and Transformers and so forth. Um, I mean, stories about Transformers. Anyway, um, I'd written a uh, then came high school and there was a, uh, I think for the high school yearbook, uh, my, for the graduating year, I think, which would have been 1994, uh, spring 1994, I, I had just been, become enthusiastic about, uh, can politics and running for president. And I guess I would figure I'd run for governor first, then president, <laughs> Uh, oh, your youthful dreams, huh? Fantasies. Anyway, you need lots of money to be able to do that. Anyway, um, and I'd written about, I'd written some poems. I wrote a poem that uh, my mom entered, somebody entered into, I'm a guy, I don't know how this happened, but uh, uh, Penn Women's um, Poetry Contest, I don't know, <laughs> it's kind of a laugh. Um, but I, I didn't get, I, you know, I didn't win high prize, but um, I got a noticeable mention or something or other. And there was somebody who um, didn't show up, so I was able to get a, a, a little model of it, the Constitution, the, um, the sailing ship, the Constitution. And being a Star Trek fan, of course, <laughs> I enjoy exploration and sailing ships would be like the precursors to the starships in the Navy of the future is depicted in the in, in Star Trek. So I like that. I, I don't think it was a bang. Anyway, anyway, um, I didn't really write that much poetry. <clears throat> um, with exception of one person I tried to, um, um, I tried to attract the attention of. I wrote poetry and I, I enjoyed writing that poetry and uh, stories and so forth. Uh, I mean letters, conversational letters. So after after graduation, um, I didn't really write stuff like that, uh, and it drifted away. It's interesting how things, you, hobbies you were interested in, or, or more like routines, beca become supplanted. Excuse me, supplanted by other routines. Namely, you go to college and you have to do deal with other stuff. Um, but I continued writing uh, teleplay scripts for TV shows and um, soon screenplays for uh, movies that I wanted to create or at least wanted to get, uh, you know, get produced. Um, so I didn't write much. I didn't really write any poetry I could think of. And then um, this is about 30 years later. Now, uh, about 27, you know, a couple of years ago, um, due to another hobby that I, I am engaged in in my other more artistic channel, 
Um, I had been interested in voices and voice control and singing, and I thought, gee, maybe I could compose my own music and perform it. So I wanted to learn about music theory, and there must be some uh, standard way because I had have, having studied screenwriting and learned all these different facets, well, not all, <laughs> I wish I had studied all these different facets, but um, being aware at least that there are lots and lots of facets that go into screenwriting that the common public probably isn't aware of, um, evidently from watching YouTube uh, reaction, first time reactions to movies, uh, a number of people aren't aware of these things in terms of movie making. Uh, so I figured the same thing would probably apply to music and I, uh, there are probably techniques that make it easy for people, uh, well, I, um, I don't know, the Beatles wrote their own music. Um, I know Prince wrote his own music. Uh, these other ones who actually wrote the music there must be some common, and, and Michael Jackson and so forth, I think he did his own, I'm pretty sure he did his own music. Anyway, um, there must be some common techniques that just make it easy to uh, not spend your time on writing the music, but actually getting it out there, I mean, and, and developing it. So that's why I, I began studying music theory, and there's a special wheel, um, I can't remember other than what I'd call the music theory wheel, but um, it's three layers. In other words, there's an inner layer, a middle layer, and an outer layer. And um, it deals with uh, B flat and, and sharp and uh, the different notes and uh, the di different from notes, keys. Uh, the keys, notes, which are different, I've learned. Uh, they're not necessarily the same. Um, Oh, I'm blanking on the name of it, but um, I'll talk about this in the future. Um, so I learned about that, and then that was maybe a couple of years ago, and then I went on to other things, you know, different things in your life get in the way, and uh, I haven't, I haven't practiced my singing voice that much, but uh, since then, but I have practiced uh, vocal um, vocal ability. Uh, talking at a higher pitch and so forth. Um, and, okay, so th these past few days, I, I have a good memory, sharp memory, when it comes to lyrics and 80s music. I love 80s music. I grew up at, during the, uh, my early childhood was, during, was in the 80s. Um, and uh, elementary school up to middle, you know, through middle school, it was only really in high school, uh, beginning freshman year of high school, that things, that it shifted from 1990 to 91 and it got into the 90s. Anyway, so I have a good memory of the 1980s and I thought through these songs and I already have an idea of the structure. Um, it seems to be, I mean, there are variations, but uh, once you know the common way of structuring a song, then you can play around. The same thing with, um, with screenwriting and storytelling. People say, oh, there are no rules, uh, write whatever you want, let it flow out, and so forth. Well, um, I think I'm a believer in knowing the basic structure. Once you know the basic structure, then you can fluctuate and play around with things. Um, so the basic structure, as I'm familiar with it, is you have like a, an instrumental in the, in the beginning without any words. And I think that my, these are my suspicions. This is not from on high. This is not from music school or anything. But my suspicion is that that's the backbeat or the, the uh, background beat that establishes your melody and... Uh, in, in order to be, a, be ha, uh, to write a popular song, you need to have a recognizable beat. You ha, need to have a recognizable, I shouldn't say beat, recognizable melody so that people can recall and connect that melody with your song. Um, make it identifiable, make it literally make it iconic. Um, so that you have the instrumental at the beginning 
And then you have what I will call a stanza. I call a stanza basically usually like four lines. Sometimes there are two or something, but, but basically a stanza. Uh, and then sometimes there are two stanzas. Um, and there may be what's called a bridge line, a bridge verse, um, which would be like a bridge, a transition from the stanza into the chorus. Now, the chorus would be uh, another section of the song, which would be maybe usually one stanza, maybe two stanzas, usually one stanza. Uh, I shouldn't even say usually, just one or two stanzas. <clears throat> so you have an instrumental you where you establish the melody, and then you have a stanza or two, and then you have the chorus, and then you have um, a second stanza or two, and then you have a chorus, and then here's the somewhat the interesting part. At, uh, after that, which would be kind of what I would call Act Three, you have a period of an instrumental where the instrumental really um, takes hold. And then after that, uh, sometimes the song goes into a chorus or repeats the chorus or do, does variations of the chorus. Or sometimes there could be a, sometimes there is a, a third kind of stanza group. So you could have like one uh, first stanza and then or stanza or two, I'll call it just one first stanza and then chorus and then second stanza and then like an instrumental period, and then either the chorus repeated again, maybe with variations, or it drifts off um, towards the end of the song, or a third stanza, or both, something like that. So there's a little bit of flexibility there. Uh, there's enough room for fle flexibility there while still maintaining a, a basic structure. Now, you could take a song like, now I, I don't have any fear, uh, I hope, I don't have any fear about YouTube striking this because I'm just mentioning songs. I hope I can just mention these songs. I'm not singing anything. Um, some songs, well, I categorized, was it, I think last year, I, earlier last year, um, I tried to figure out like three categories, or I tried to figure out different categories of songs, uh, different, what I would call genres, which is a French term, which literally means type or category of song. There's one that I would call praise uh, or adoration. Uh, basically, it's a song singing about how great something is. Um, and there's no contradiction. There's no pushback in during the song. It's just how great and wonderful this thing is. Um, then there's another type that I think of as more intellectually developed where there's a c conflict and you see the same thing in film and TV good stories akin to good songs good stories have some kind of a conflict and you're 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 going back and forth and the interesting thing is which way would you go and it's it's also arguing both points and that gets into dramatica which is a whole other thing it's a fascinating theory that I've talked about many times on this channel. So in this second category, uh, it, it focuses more on the conflict. It's, uh, you may have like the opening stanza, you may have the um, bad things about this or, or, or bad things about where you are uh, in life or something like that. And then the chorus is suggesting some alternative way, some alternative approach. And then it, maybe it goes back and forth, could depend on the song structure. There are probably different ways people do it. They could structure it, you know, back and forth, back and forth, or I imagine they could structure it where it's kind of more uh, persuasive, where as the stanzas go on, the songwriter is being persuaded towards this alternative point of view, something like that. I, I think you get my idea. So one comes to mind is Flowers by Miley Cyrus. At the beginning, um, she sings about how, uh, I don't want to recite lyrics, uh, she sings about how things have broken down and what had been hope, you know, uh, what had been some source of hope built up has broken down. 
And then in the chorus, she sings about how she, in so many words, uh, she can uh, um, not rely on anyone else. I hope I'm reading that correctly, but she can, she can have herself at least um, to keep herself company rather than depending on someone else. I think if I read the song correctly. And then it's sort of more persuasive, meaning there, there's a conflict there. And she's, she's reminding herself about how she can um, just live being content just being by herself. And there's a song, there's another song by Gloria Stefan, or, or sung by, at least by Gloria Stefan. I don't know if she wrote it too, uh, and the Miami Sound Machine called Get On Your Feet, where it starts off um, a very depressing state. In some sense, I mean, <laughs> funny as funny as it sounds, it I liken it sort of to Franklin Delano, Delano Roosevelt, the president, um, his T tenure in office where um, it was the Great Depression and ironically the song is get on your feet even though he could he was in a wheelchair so he could not stand on his feet I did not mean that in any weird way but in some sense maybe ironically maybe um, maybe his presidency where he inspired hope I mean I'm, I'm speaking it biased as a Democrat but um, he spoke about hope and he, he, he tried to keep the country going. Um, I liken that perhaps to the fact that he couldn't physically stand on his feet. So he got the country mobilized and he put all of his energy into that weird way of, in, weird way of thinking about maybe, but maybe you get my idea. So it's funny that a song, Get On Your Feet, um, I would associate with him the song itself is um, a, uh, the singer singing about how um, uh, the hopes have been dashed. You think the you meaning this other person, the singer is singing to, um, thinks hopes have gone away and there's no more hope and things are practically dying, and then there's a little bit of hope. Uh, and then she sings, get on your feet and make it happen. And to, uh, the next day, uh, uh, look forward to the next day and look forward to the, the future and keep working towards the future. And that reminded me of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, and then he talks, she talks about um, in the second stanza about um, we've all been through some nasty weather. And of course, the Dust Bowls. Uh, making the depression even worse and plight and so forth. Um, and then again, that sense of hope, get on your feet and keep going and look towards tomorrow and look towards the future. So you can see that conflict uh, in there. So that's the second type. The first type is adoration, where it's simply a song um, praising something, the traits about or attributes about something or someone uh, and then the second one is this conflict type thing, and I forget what the third, I remember there being a third category, but um, what have I learned in, uh, you may be wondering, what the heck is he talking about? Okay, what have I now learned? Well, one, I remember in high school, when I was writing that poetry, uh, it was good, but the stanzas were very long. And I did have a rhyme scheme at the end. I think sometimes I tried to have what they call, you know, the first line ends with something and then the second line ends with a word that would eventually rhyme with the fourth line and then the third line doesn't rhyme with any. The first and third lines don't rhyme at the end and the second and fourth lines rhyme. Uh, so uh, so I, sometimes I tried to have like the first and third lines rhyming and the second and fourth lines rhyming. And I made the stand, the, the verses way too long and I crammed a bunch of stuff in there. No, 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 no. Like my screenwriting efforts, um, I learned to keep it shorter, keep it more straightforward and keep it simpler, but you don't have to dumb it down. You can think of other more picturesque ways of 
carrying forth your message. Just don't, uh, don't beat a dead horse, not beat a dead horse, don't um, prolong, don't, don't lengthen, don't make it too long. So this past week, I've been posting on my Facebook uh, page some, uh, admittedly, some free verse stuff where I was just expressing my thoughts, but I'd begun to practice writing them in four-line stanzas. Or, at least, or, or drafts of parts of a song in free verse, or uh, then I've begun to make them rhyme, the second and fourth lines. And in doing so, uh, I impre- and had just that practice alone, I thought, well, if these are, have the same melody and it's a, a consistent melody, then they should probably have a similar or the same number of syllables in the line, at least like this, if the second and fourth lines, second and fourth verses should rhyme, they probably should match or, or come pretty close one or two syllables off of the same syllable count, not word count, but syllable count, so that a syllable, roughly one syllable, would equal one note. Of course, you can vary it a bit by having stretched notes and so forth, but anyway, I'm not, that's when you actually get to write, composing the melody and then melding the two together. So that's what I've learned so far. And maybe I'll come on this channel again and talk about um, other aspects of music theory. So um, thanks for tuning in and I'll um, talk with you next time. Bye.